is now time for questions. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for. Excuse me. Uh, the pre, uh, okay, sorry. Let's go with the fi minister of finance, Speaker. Uh, under the finance minister, TO 2015 CEO's $552,000 salary was reduced by $75,000 only once we exposed this injustice. Similarly, the Pan Am Secretariat Deputy Minister was removed only once we exposed his $361,000 salary. And only once the news of unlimited entitlement broke did the Liberals agree to stricter expense policies and repayment. You only act once you're caught, Minister. Can you tell me exactly when the unlimited expensing will be remedied and the expenses in bad faith repaid? Who's the Minister for Pan Am? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. I also appreciate the fact that uh, the critic has long been apprised of the activities of the Pan and Parapan American Games since the outset when we invited him back then to participate and to uh, uh, recognize what it is that's being done. He knows fully well that Deloitte and others are reviewing the, re the reports that we have monitoring on a quarterly basis. He's well aware, Mr. Speaker, that as a result of the outstanding work of Infrastructure Ontario and the, whip, and the work we've done for uh, establishing venues across southern Ontario and the province, we have now come under budget by $50 million, Mr. Speaker, for those capital expenditures. This is going to leave a tremendous legacy for future generations in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the, uh, I am well aware. I'm well aware that the Pan Am budget is disingenuous at best. The only time a Liberal is spurred to action is by holding their feet to the fire, Speaker. Yesterday, I asked the Pan Am, or the other day, I asked the Pan Am Minister about the real cost of Pan Am. He told me about chicken nuggets, Speaker. Since you previously held the portfolio and as finance minister, the buck still stops with you. Perhaps you can tell us why you hid multiple budgets off the record of Pan Am. The ones I'm talking about specifically, Minister, are the recently discovered $10 million for the Secretariat partying and paperwork, the $709 dollars for for $9 million for another legacy venue, and no doubt millions more for security and transportation. Minister, how many Pan Am budgets have you approved, and what is the grand total cost of the games what to the, the taxpayers of Ontario? Pan Am boondog. So, Mr. Speaker, I find it passing strange that the member opposite is now asking a question about Pan Am when yesterday in estimates committee he had two hours. Two hours to ask the minister responsible for the Pan Am what it is that he's and the only question. That the, minister, that, the, uh, that the critic had to ask, the only question in those two hours was the following, Mr. Speaker. He said, he said to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games, he said, how are you, minister? Oh! That was all they asked yesterday of the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. The opposition are making a complete mockery of the committee process. They're using filibustering, they're delaying the issues. They had 10 senior officials of the ministry there yesterday to deal with the very issues. So, Mr. Speaker, he's talking about budgets. We have been very open and from the outset as to what we're doing. He should read the budget, Mr. Speaker. Maybe they would know then. Give me a break. Speaker, they've had two years and more to get this right. And since we discovered the hidden Pan Am budgets, the minister's been dodging responsibility for the games. In estimates committee, he pointed at the board of TO 2015. Then the deputy minister clarified that uh, the minister secretariat actually babysits TO 2015. So the minister improvised and talked about the many Pan Am partners instead. But at the end of the day, it is the premier, you, and the minister of their portfolio that's responsible. So why can't I get an answer about why there are so many Pan Am budgets not included in the pretend $1.4 billion? Minister, how many budgets are there? How much will the Pan Am Games really cost the taxpayers of Ontario? Much? Out. What's the number? Tell me now. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, here, here he is again asking questions, and he should have been asking those questions yesterday in committee. He chose not to. More importantly, he knows the answers because we've given it to them two years ago. The budgets are very clearly stated out. We have over $50 million in under-budget capital expenditures to date. We recognize the challenges that we face, and we put it to the to, uh, to the, to the 2015 committee. But more importantly, and I quote the following from today's editorial. <laughs> 
And this speaks to the essence of why we have taken and we do take responsibility for bringing these games to the province of Ontario. And it's as follows. When properly done, such events energize cities and a lot is being handled well here. Pan Am site construction on progress so far, running $50 million under budget. Answer. That's to be commended. He further states, instead of fanning fake scandals and tarnishing Toronto's games, critics should Thank take you. comfort in knowing that existing problems are... The member from uh, Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. No question. The member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Hey, Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question uh, today is for the Minister of Labour. Recently, Minister, your Premier met with our leader, Tim Hudak, to seek support in passing nine handpicked bills. One of the bills that your Premier presented was my bill, Bill 74. Here, but here. yesterday, your government acted like a coward, bowed to union pressure, and announced you would no longer support this important bill. Minister, why do you value your friendship with one union leader more than the thousands of good jobs, both unionized and non-unionized, that you have now put at jeopardy with your weak leadership and flip-flopping? Flip -flopping. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank the member uh, opposite for the question. Uh, speaker, as I uh, referenced yesterday in the House uh, during a question period, late last Friday a decision was rendered by the Ontario Divisional Court as it related uh, to uh, the uh, decision of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. The Divisional, divisional Court decision was uh, uh, on a judicial review application by Alice Dawn. Um, and it's the it's the subject of the same uh, same issue that uh, is part of the members' uh, bill 74. Speaker, the divisional court, in its very thorough analysis, quashed the decision of the Ontario Liber, uh, uh, Labor Relations Board, which means that the company can operate under the status quo. And the Ministry of Labor lawyers have uh, advised uh, us that this essentially achieves the same Answer. outcome as was intended by the private member's Bill 74. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Ellis Dawn is a London, Ontario company that is widely regarded as a community leader, including being named 2013's number two best employer in Canada and a platinum member of Canada's 50 best managed companies. Good. Minister, Ellis Dawn is also an employee owned company, employees that number in the thousands. Yesterday, your Premier said that my bill is no longer needed and that you would not be supporting it. Will you and your government resume your support of my important bill that stands up for Ontario, or does Pat Dillon call the shots around here? Who's calling the shots? Speaker, the divisional court has done uh, has issued a very thorough decision. I'm sure the member opposite has read the decision, and essentially what the decision does is it maintains the status quo. It essentially does, and that's what the advice has been given to us by the lawyers at Ministry of Labour uh, as to what is intended in Bill 74. So uh, it's, it's basically it's status quo. But I also want to inform the member opposite and, and all parties that if the party wishes to appeal this decision, uh, they must file an application with the Court of Appeal seeking leave to appeal by October the 15th. 4 p.m. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, back to the Minister. It is unfair to expect an Ontario company to live by one set of rules while foreign competitors undercut them, putting at risk thousands of good jobs. My Bill 74 will settle this issue once and for all, but your colleague, Pat Dillon, has asked you to oppose it, and clearly, Minister, you have listened. Minister, Pat Dillon has several government appointments, including as a member of the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, a member of the Board of Infrastructure Ontario, a member of the Board for the College of Trades, and is also your key advisor on transit taxes. Coincidentally, Speaker, Pat Dillon is also an ally of this government's influential Working Families Coalition well, he is that spent $10 million electing the Liberals, Speaker. Minister, do you think it's right to put an Ontario company and Ontario jobs at risk in favour of one union leader?
Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, our government has a plan for the economy that builds people up and invests in things that matter. Speaker, stable labor. I'm going to keep you guessing as to when I'm going to act. Minister of Labor. St stable labor relations is very much part and parcel of building, uh, building a productive, healthy uh, uh, economy that uh, attracts the more investment the question, and creates jobs uh, to our economy. Speaker, I don't think this side of the House here, the government, is going to take any lectures from the members opposite who have shown nothing but bring our economy down in Ontario by proposing policies that is going to cut jobs in our province, that's going to reduce wages for both unionized and non-unionized workers. By promoting policies like right to work for Answer. less, they are going to create a havoc in the province, uh, Speaker. Even John Tory, their former leader, have had given them advice as not to follow. Thank you. Your question, leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is to the government House Leader. Uh, the government House Leader has tabled a motion that will allow speedy passage of a bill designed by Liberal and Conservative lobbyists to help Ellis Dawn, one of the uh, Liberal Party's biggest donors. Yesterday, the Premier spun a, a very confusing tale about Liberal plans for the bill, Speaker. So I have a pretty simple question. Is the government proceeding with their programming motion, or are they backing off plans to ram this bill through the House? Sir, Mr. Speaker, I don't know where to begin in, in, in correcting the well, facts. Begin with, the NDP begin with what was put forward. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is no one is ramming through anything. We came forward with a motion to this House well, which has NDP eight funders. bills as well as the formation of a select committee on developmental services. And all the motion does is outline a reasonable schedule for Bob debate discussion and votes that. by this House on these bills. In some cases, they will be going to committee. In other cases, they will be coming here for third reading. Mr. Speaker, that is the extent of it, and when I sat down with the fellow House leaders and showed them a draft of the bill, I certainly said we would be willing to entertain any changes if people want a little more debate here or, or a different way of dealing with committee, but Mr. Speaker, the NDP did not want to have that discussion, so we came forward with yes, this sir. programming motion, and yes, Mr. Speaker, we do uh, intend to pass it and then go on to have serious consideration of these important bills as well as the formation. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, yesterday we heard a lot of spin from the Premier, but what we didn't get was a clear answer. We put forward an amendment to the government motion that would take the Ellis Don bill off of the fast track. Will the Liberal members support that amendment? Mr. Speaker, I think the Premier was very clear yesterday. She was speaking to one bill of that list of eight. That bill is intended to remedy a situation, a ruling by the Ontario Labour Relations Board. Since discussions amongst the parties, we have had a court ruling which quashed the Ontario Labour Relations Board ruling, and the Speaker made the very obvious point that the bill is no longer necessary, and that is our position under the assumption that there won't be an appeal. I think the Premier put forward a very uh, straightforward situation. That is our uh, position at the moment uh, over here. We look forward to debate and discussion in front of the committee. There'll be an opportunity for hearings. There'll be an opportunity for amendments. An opportunity should it proceed through committee for a final vote here. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Liberals can play hot potato with this bill as much as they want, but it doesn't change the fact that their hands have been all over it. Yesterday, the Conservative sponsor of this bill told reporters that they weren't the ones who put the bill on the fast track. He claims it was the Premier who made the Delivering for Alice Dawn Act a priority. Will the government House Leader confirm that it was, in fact, the Liberals, not the Conservatives, who asked to fast track this bill? Mr. Speaker, the bill, the bill in question is a private member's bill that was drafted by the member for Lambton-Kent Middlesex. 
What I find unbelievable, Mr. Speaker, is that the NDP last spring were all in favour of programming motions when it came to the yeah, financial accountability that. officer and the passage of the budget. Mr. Speaker, we worked very closely on it when it came to the issue of closure. They stood and voted with the government in terms of closure. But what I find incredible is when it's a programming motion that they support, they're all in favour of it, when it's a programming motion with a number of very important bills that all parties in this House support, all of a sudden they've changed their tune, Mr. Speaker. Let's have consistency in this legislature. All we are doing is putting forward a motion which will allow for further debate and discussion on a list of bills that are important to the yes, people sir. of Ontario and which there's a lot of interest here in this legislature. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My next question is to the Acting Premier. The people who make this province work every day have been uh, looking for some help. Help for their aging parents who are waiting for home care, help for their kids who are looking for jobs, help for their pocketbooks when it comes to the bills at the end of the month. But, Speaker, they're still waiting. Can the Acting Premier explain how the Ellis Dawn bill that the Liberals are now scrambling to back away from became a priority? Acting Premier, Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, the, the leader of the third party talks about something extremely important, and that's the work that we've done as a party for the last 10 years to help working families here in Ontario. I'm pleased to say that we've cut taxes for 93 per cent of Ontario taxpayers. We've established cooperative securities regular sign just recently with British Columbia. We've introduced Financial Transparency and Accountability Act that no other government can then hide deficits as they did in the, in the past. We reformed Pensions uh, Benefit Act to modernize rules to assist employers and protect workers. We've reduced high business education tax rates. We introduced property and sales tax credits for seniors and low to moderate income families. We've harmonized the sales tax, which none of them had the courage to do. We eliminated capital tax for business. We reformed property tax systems so that it's predictable for homeowners Answer. by phasing out property taxes. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we supported the auto sector and many others. We have over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Speaker, here's what people see when it comes to their needs, their health care, their jobs, the cost of their everyday lives. The government delivers a lot of conversation, but not much results at all. But when it's time to move a power plant to win some seats or deliver for a well-connected donor, the government can spring into action at a moment's notice. What does the Acting Premier think that says about the government's priorities? So, as mentioned, Mr. Speaker, we've been working very hard for hard working Ontarians, and we will continue to do so regardless of, the fa of what the others say they would do and never do. We have taken the initiative to bring forward uh, job strategies for working Ontarians that no others, as I have, over 183 per cent return of those jobs since the recession, Mr. Speaker. That's why we'll continue to support and make transformations to health care so that we we're able to supply even more services to those that need it at more affordable rates. In the end, Mr. Speaker, it's about helping everybody. The, me the member opposite is talking about one issue. We can deal with more than one issue at a time on this side Thank of the you. House. Final supplementary. Speaker, people are waiting for government to make their challenges a priority. Instead, they see insiders expensing parking fees while they collect six-figure salaries, millions and millions, hundreds of millions, spent moving gas plants, and well-connected insiders getting results in the legislature while everyday people are stuck waiting. When is this government going to start delivering results for the people who make this province work each and every day? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's let's talk about those results. Since the February of this year alone, we've increased investment in home care and community care by 1% annually. We've invested $260 million in home and community care, $185 million in home care for approximately 46,000 more seniors. We made reforms to physiotherapy that will double the number of clinics and provide 200,000 more supports for seniors. We've invested $2.5 million for enhanced breastfeeding supports and many other things to help families and their infants get a good start in life. 
But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, since 2003, we've done a tremendous amount of work to help reduce wait times, to provide for more hospitals, more nurses, and more doctors, more medical schools, more youth employment, more support to, to bring forward a positive economic growth in our province, a province that all of us are very proud of and will continue to, to work alongside those hardworking Ontarians who Thank make you. it a success for us all. Thank you. New question. The member from Chatham, Kent Essex. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Acting Premier. Later today, we will be debating my bill, Bill 101. Good bill. To put a cap on third party advertising. But we know why your government won't support my bill because the Working Family Coalition spent $9 million keeping you in power. But what truly surprises me is this government's complete change in position. On April 8, 2013, when the Premier was asked about changing the rules around third-party advertising, she said, I'm very interested in looking at the recommendations and open to looking at changes that could be made. Moreover, the Attorney General, John Gerritsen, said this, the notion of putting a spending limit on third parties certainly strikes me Question. as being something that is well worth looking into. And oh, by the way, the leader of the third party also advocates changing the restrictions. Question, acting Thank premier, you. what? Thank what? you. Thank you. When I stand, you sit. Acting premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It appears to me the member opposite just doesn't accept the results of various by-elections and the rejections that many have placed on the PCs and their activities. And what's important, though, and as a result of past performances by that party, we, on this side of the House, have introduced transparency and more accountability. In 2005, we introduced real-time disclosure rules. This allows political parties and leadership contestants to file with the chief electoral officer within 10 days. It also requires the chief electoral officer to publish information about the contributions made on elections in Ontario. Excuse me. When I mention the member from Renfrew's name, it should be the signal that says, stop, not continue. You never heard me. You know why? <laughs> Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, of course, we've introduced more uh, legislation. In 2007, we introduced the third party advertising rules in Ontario for the first time. All of these are encouraging and ensuring that we have more transparency and more openness. And the opposite party, they voted against those okay. items, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. <clears throat> uh, to the acting premier, uh, the influence that the special interest groups have over this government is obvious, and quite frankly, it's quite alarming. A few months ago, the premier and senior members of this government made it clear that you were open to changing the rules surrounding third-party advertising, and today you have completely flip-flopped. How could you possibly go from being open to something just a few months ago to being completely opposed to something today? It just doesn't make sense. Is there a reason why you've changed your position? Or did the Working Family Coalition boss, Patrick Dillon, write another letter to you telling you not to support this bill? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite is not accusing this side of the House in as much as he's insulting the public. I, uh, I, I, I question why I have to get to this point where I have to threaten people to be thrown out. Every time the person stands up, it just starts yelling. It doesn't make sense to me, truly, and it's going to stop. So if you push it, I'll throw you out. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite, in many respects, is underestimating and insulting the very intelligence of voters in the public. We have, under current rules, third parties that spend more than $500 or more on election advertising are required to register with the chief electoral officer. We put that in place. They voted against that. Registered third parties must also report to the CEO on election advertising expenses. If election advertising expenses are $5,000 or more, these reports must be audited. These rules ensure that there is transparency and free speech, Mr. Speaker. These guys don't want to have free speech in this, uh, this public democracy, Mr. Speaker. 
Number four, Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question this morning is to the Minister of uh, Transportation and Inf Infrastructure. Good morning, Minister. Minister, the independent report in the Herb Gray Parkway has made it clear that the girders installed by FreezeNet are not up to standard. And to quote uh, one portion of that report, the only option is to replace deficient and non-compliant girders with new ones that are constructed in the course of the environment will come to order. The applicable requirements for design construction. Minister, why are you not listening to the recommendation of the report and choosing instead to salvage instead of replacing these girders? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I again want to thank the member for his very sincere concern about this. I think it's a concern we both share. Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear about this because I, I was somewhat disappointed when I read some of the reporting on this, and I think a fundamental fact is missing. The independent expert review looked in detail at this for two months. The committee is still working today, and testing is continuing. I made two very clear commitments which I intend to keep. The first one was that we would not open a single structure until the chief engineer of the province, who always makes these decisions and whom this competency and trust is placed by the people of Ontario, Answer. signs off on them. The second thing I said is that this would not be a political decision. Whatever the chief engineer decided, based on his Thank expertise, you. based purely on engineering, would be Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Minister, you mentioned the reporting. I don't know if you saw the editorial cartoon in the Windsor Star today that has the girder with Band-Aids slapped all over it, and that's uh, an editorial comment onto itself. The report says that the test results around salvaging the girders did not address all the concerns related to durability of the girders made by FreezeNet. On July the 22nd, sir, in a press release, you said, and I quote, the girders in question will be removed unless the safety and durability can be assured and any compliance concerns are addressed. Minister, what made you change your mind? Minister. Mr. Speaker. The one thing I've gotten in Ontario is a much thicker skin, and uh, I don't think we should uh, allow cartoonists to be making engineering decisions. <laughs> Number two, Mr. Speaker, who should make this decision? Should it be the Minister of Transportation? Should it be the member opposite? Should it be the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing? No, Mr. Speaker. The decision must be made by the Chief Engineer. The condition of the girders at this point, of some of those girders, is not adequate. If any of those girders are not up to the high standards of the highway code and the bridge code and cannot meet that threshold to be as safe as any other girders, they will not be installed Answer. or they will be removed. That determination will not be made by politicians, Mr. Speaker. It will be made by engineers, specifically the Thank Chief you. Engineer of Ontario. A new question, the member from the Republic of Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise on behalf of my constituents, uh, the Great Riding of Etobicoke North, with a question for the Honourable Minister of Community and Social Services. Speaker, the mark of a just society is how that society treats its most vulnerable. Investing in people, their opportunities, their future is important to the conduct of any government. I know firsthand from my community that constituents who have relied on social assistance in a time of need appreciate that support for their loved ones. Even those members of society who do not avail themselves of social assistance value the fact that such a system is in place, on call, as it were, for those who may need it. I recall, Speaker, that a part of our government's poverty reduction strategy was to initiate the first review of social assistance in more than 20 years. The Commission for the Review of Social Assistance in Ontario published recommendations to better the system for all Ontarians. With the guidance of the Commission, the government envisions a more improved system that is more accountable, Thank you. And delivers services and supports. I ask the minister Thank to inform you. this chamber. Minister of Community and Social Services. Hey, speaker, and I want to thank the member for his uh, question. I know from conversations with all members of the House that 
We're all committed to, uh, Order. to working towards a fairer society. I'm pleased to report, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, our government will be investing some four, $400 million plus dollars over the next three years to, to help make the prospects of some 912,000 plus people uh, in Ontario just a little bit brighter. Great. Social assistance rates have been increased by 1% for families on Ontario Works and individuals with disabilities on the ODSP program. As well, children, uh, sorry, single adults without children will receive a top up of $14 a month for a total increase of $20. Uh, these increases are Answer. in this week, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, is there more for us to do? You betcha. But you know what? These changes are going to help. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I uh, thank the minister not only for his answer today, but his ongoing commitment and sincere efforts on these files. The much-needed target rate increase will be welcome news uh, for those in my riding and across Ontario for people who depend on Ontario Works and ODSP. However, learning from recipients in my riding, I know that such supports, though important, are nevertheless not all that there is to social assistance. Social assistance, they tell me, is about more than a check. Other benefits, Speaker, include employment supports and skills training, child care support so people can work and earn a better life for their families, and job placement supports for people with disabilities to achieve greater financial independence. So I ask once again, Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you inform this House what other changes have been made to social assistance and what are the plans going forward? Oh. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, the member is right, and I'm delighted to respond. Uh, new rules now allow uh, social assistance uh, uh, individuals to keep up to $200 of the money that they earn. This, of course, is going to allow them to gain a quicker foothold uh, in the economy and to affirm uh, uh, you know, their, their efforts. Uh, Ontario Works clients can also keep more assets so they won't have to give up everything they own before they're eligible for assistance. Speaker, as part of the Ontario government's economic plan to invest in people, invest in infrastructure, and support a dynamic and innovative business climate, we're committed to helping more people find jobs. In the past uh, a few months, my cabinet colleagues and I have been seeking input from people all across this province on what can be done through renewed poverty reduction strategies. Yes, we've been listening and we've been learning and we're committed to further action and I look forward to working with all members of the House to yep. make things just a little bit better. Thank you. Good question. The member from Perth, Wellington. Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. At the Fort Erie racetrack, people are losing their jobs, all because of this government's deliberate destruction of the horse racing industry. Absolutely. The minister sat at the table when that callous decision was made. It was made without warning, without consultation, and without even so much as an economic analysis. Will the minister apologize today to the people of Fort Erie and the people of rural Ontario for not speaking up when he had the chance. Absolutely. Minister of Rural Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government believes in a strong, sustainable future for the horse racing industry in Ontario. Our plan is guided by the work being done by the Horse Racing Transition Panel. The panel is made up of three very distinguished people. John Wilkinson, John Stoblin, and Albert Buchanan. Premier Wade has asked the member from Northumberland will come to order. Five-year plan for the industry. Their plan will present a roadmap for sustainability for the industry, including grassroots and larger tracks. I'm confident, and with the panel reports on his recommendations of the five-year plan, the industry will have the confidence it needs at every track that wishes to conduct live racing will have the opportunity to do so. The horse racing industry is vital to rural communities across this great province. Our government will continue to work with Ontario and the horse racing community to ensure that racing remains vibrant in this province for years to come. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Speaker, I did not hear an apology. That's shameful. Neither have we heard an apology from the leader of the NDP for her part in passing the budget that has already cost 9,000 jobs. Because of that deal with the NDP, the future of the 100-year-old Fort Erie racetrack is uncertain at best. Fort Erie has suffered some devastating blows at the hands of this government. You've shut down their ER, you've closed their tourism office, and now this. If the minister won't apologize, let's put it this way. 
Why is it more important to hang on to a few dozen jobs for Liberal and NDP politicians Absolutely. than it is to hang on to so many thousands of jobs in the horse racing no industry? Respect. Not even the priciest of panels can excuse them for that. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to a vibrant and sustainable future for horse racing in the province of Ontario and is central to our plan going forward. As part of our future, a government commissioned a panel to develop a five-year plan for horse racing industry that's accountable, transparent, customer-focused, and a net benefit for the taxpayers of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, our friends across the floor can't have it both ways. They can't bluster one week that the slots of racetrack program should be reinstated, then come here two weeks later and say it wasn't accountable. As we say in Peterborough, Mr. Speaker, that dog doesn't hunt. I'll repeat again. For the member across the way, because it seems he wasn't listening on any occasion or three occasions, we got a plan. We're going to bring a plan forward, and horse racing will be vibrant in the province of Ontario. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le Premier ministre. I have a question for the um, Deputy Premier, Acting Premier. Bacteria at level that constitute a threat to public health. The Ministry found out about this risk three months ago. My question is simple. Why did the Ministry of Health not warn the public when it first learned about this health risk? Acting Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, uh, Dr. Arlene King issued a warning to consumers and businesses not to consume or, s or serve uh, bottled water manufactured by the Blue Glass Water Company Limited, also known as Caledon Clearwater Corporation. It is a federal issue, as the member opposite knows, but we take steps to protect our public and samples of water taken from the company's products have been found to have some contamination with bacteria. As a result, we feel there is a potential health threat posed by these products. So, in accordance with Ontario's Health Protection and Promotion Act, Blue Glass Water Company Limited was ordered to cease operations related to bottling, processing, and distributing water. Inspections of public health units have identified the products in food establishments in Hamilton and Niagara, as well as the continued presence of some of the product in food establishments here in Toronto. The ministry is carefully investigating and monitoring Answer. the situation with public health units to ensure public safety. Mr. Thank Speaker. You, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, something is wrong. When the Ontario Ministry of Health finds out that a product sold in Toronto, Niagara, Hamilton, and elsewhere in Ontario is unsafe, for consumption, yet it fails to warn the public. To protect the health of Ontarians is the Ministry of Health primary mandate. Is it really ministry policy to wait until somebody gets sick or maybe even dies before letting the public know about contaminated water? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, I, um, you know, I appreciate the question, and I know the member opposite shares the same concerns that we all do in this House, and that is public safety, it's people's health, it's people's uh, well-being. To suggest otherwise or to infer, infer that we are putting people's lives at risk is not, I believe, your intent, because I know that we all work together to do just that. We rely on the advice of Dr. King. We have taken the steps necessary to work with our partners through the Ministry of Health, and we will continue to press and make those decisions as we find them out. But please, we're all in this together, and we're fighting for the benefit of our public. No one's been hurt at this point, and Thank we you. intend that not to occur. Thank you. Your question, the member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the uh, very hardworking Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Absolutely well-deserved kudos to the Minister. Speaker, the parents and families in my riding of Vaughan are concerned about youth unemployment and the rate of youth unemployment in our province and the future of their children. As young people struggle to find good opportunities for employment, it is important for our government to listen, and it's important also, Speaker, that we take action. 
I am delighted to hear that the province has taken up the challenge and implemented the Youth Employment Fund to help youth find good jobs and experience in our growing economy. Speaker, can the minister please update the House as to how young people across our province and in my community of Vaughan can benefit from the Youth Employment Fund? Minister of Training Calls the University. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question, obviously, but I want to thank him as well for his leadership in Vaughan, standing up for young people in that community, a fast growing community, lots of youth in that area. And the member knows that our government has risen to the challenge of tackling youth unemployment and the creation of the Youth, un un uh, youth Employment Fund, and will continue to ensure that, that helping our young people is indeed a top priority. I'm proud to report that after just one week, Mr. Speaker, 535 youth have had active job placements after just one week, with 126 more young people wow. beginning placements that will, will happen in the very near future. Very Mr. Speaker, we're off to a very, very good start. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the hardworking people at Employment Ontario and our service providers for putting this program out there in, in a very short period of time, yes, getting sir. it up and running. Mr. Speaker, they're out there for our young people. I encourage all members from all parties, when young people approach them in their constituency offices, to refer them to their Thank local you. service provider to help them Thank find work. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for his outstanding work on this file. The people of my riding, the people of our province are very lucky to have him on the job. I am thrilled to hear that this particular fund has been a huge success across this province. The unemployment rate amongst our youth is an issue that certainly deserves our government's attention. Speaker, I am pleased to hear that this program is accessible to youth across the province, though my primary concern is with the youth in my riding of Vaughan and in other important communities in Ontario, like Niagara Falls. Speaker, Youth unemployment is very apparent in communities, and many of our young people face great barriers each and every day. Speaker, through you to the minister, I'd like to know exactly how the youth of Vaughan and the youth of Niagara Falls can benefit from the Youth Employment Fund. Thank you, Minister. That's an interesting question, Mr. Speaker. The, the Youth Employment Fund provides up to $7,800 for each eligible youth for a flexible range of supports, including training and financial assistance, and to cover costs like transportation and tools. Youth and employers can apply for this fund by reaching out to their local Employment Ontario service providers. I know for a fact, Mr. Speaker, for instance, youth in Vaughan can benefit from two Employment Ontario service providers, Seneca College of Applied Arts and Technology, which is located at 14, 1490 uh, Major Mackenzie Drive, and the Toronto District School Board, located at 4585 uh, high, uh, high on Highway 7. Mr. Speaker, these service providers are out there in places like Niagara Falls, but are right across the province to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that our young people have access to this very Answer. important program. Putting young people to work, Mr. Speaker, is a priority for this government. We're going to ensure this program is delivered on time, on Thank budget, you. and ensure that our young people get Thank you. New question, the member from Central Grey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, on September 18th, uh, 18th, I asked you in question period what the government is doing to resolve an outstanding split pension issue that has been unresolved for years concerning public sector employees that have been affected by past public sector divestments. Your response two weeks ago did not answer my question and was some general nonsense about pensions in general, retirement planning, what your government was doing, all stuff we already knew. So I'm not sure if then you simply couldn't answer my question or what the problem was, but thousands of public sector employers, employees wanted and deserve an answer. So, Minister, again today, I'll ask you the same question. What is your government doing to help thousands of paramedics, thousands of MPAC employees and thousands of other public sector workers that are affected by the split pension issue? And why is it taking your government so long to fix this injustice? Thank you, Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. I appreciate the concern the member opposite has in regards to pension and reform and the benefits necessary to protect workers as well as employers. And that's why we've taken initial steps, and they're outlined in our budget as well, around enhancement to CPP, for example, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that that's a broad-based initiative to help uh, our, our uh, workers in Ontario. We also included uh, PRPPs, Mr. Speaker, a pooled registered retirement plan to help those that aren't saving. But to the point that the, minute the member opposite requests, we recognize that regulations are coming soon in the fall. We will continue to do our utmost to try to resolve issues going forward. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. I, I really don't think you give a damn at all about these people. 
I would, I would ask the member to withdraw. The withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I don't understand. I've been at this issue for five years. Uh, many of these people are now thousands of public sector employees are starting to retire. Um, they, their employer changed uh, through no fault of their own because ambulance services moved to upper tier government from hospital based services. MPAC employees used to be revenue. Uh, uh, tax uh, property assessment people in your ministry or the Ministry of Revenue, and they moved to MPAC, and yet their pensions were adversely didn't follow them, and they're adversely affected by this. Many of them will be out thousands and thousands of dollars that they paid for. This doesn't cost you money. This is their money. Now, I know the unions run the pensions. Are they running this government on this issue too? Because they don't want us to take the time to transfer the money. Uh, to the uh, uh, other pension plans run by other unions. Thank and you. I have learned over time these unions don't get along. Thank you. Are you in the union's pockets again? Before any other members get themselves into water that they don't want to be in, I'm going to just tell the member that I'm not happy with this last part and that I would hope that we would race to the top and not to the bottom with the kinds of comments that I'm hearing. I'm going to offer the member, the minister, an opportunity to answer the question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's unfortunate that the premise of the question now is about bashing labour and bashing the very people that are hard-working Ontarians in our province who are in need of support with their pensions. And that's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Many public sector employees whose pensions are affected by past government-initiated restructuring want consolidation with their split pension entitlements in a single plan. We get that. We've made reforms to the Pension Benefit Act. We've taken regulatory provisions that are necessary to, uh, message to, message to before those reforms are implemented. We posted draft regulations in February of 2013, consulted up until April the 15th of 2013. On July 12th of 2013, we posted a draft regulations on regulatory registry regarding asset transfers, and we've made consultations that closed in September. So, Mr. Speaker, Answer. After comments are received and appropriate changes are made, both regulations will be presented to Cabinet, and that will happen in the fall of this Thank year. You. Mr. Speaker. New question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Last weekend, a Peterborough woman was out walking her dogs when she was attacked by a black bear. Thankfully, due to the actions of her dogs, she survived. This is the latest in a series of human nuisance bear encounters across the province. Will it take a tragedy before this government reconsiders its short sighted decision to scrap the Bear Wise program? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the question from the member opposite with regard to this uh, particular issue. And I think we're all very relieved that the uh, incident in question that we're uh, speaking about and that the member is speaking about uh, didn't result in uh, something more serious. And uh, obviously, our thoughts are with uh, the individual. Uh, there has been, uh, as the members uh, pointed out, there has been uh, a number of uh, nuisance bear issues uh, this uh, spring in particular uh, and throughout the summer uh, that have been particularly challenging in many northern communities. And uh, as a northerner, we take this issue very seriously. Public safety is paramount when it comes to the safety of individuals uh, in northern Ontario and throughout the province of Ontario, for that matter. Uh, Speaker, we are working with our ministry officials to develop a plan that will see a more effective response when it comes to nuisance bear issues Sir? in the province of Ontario, as this issue has been raised by members of the opposite, as well as members in our own caucus. There are members uh, on this side of the House as well Thank that you. are very passionate about this issue and that care. Thank you. Supplementary. My, supplem my supplementary is also to the Minister of Natural Resources. The people of Ontario, including Northerners, we need more than a plan. We need action. The government doesn't seem to have a problem with ignoring the safety concerns of Northerners or downloading the responsibility of dealing with rogue bears onto the police and Northern municipalities. Shame. But this latest attack happened just east of Toronto. Bear attacks are getting harder and harder to ignore, as the minister has acknowledged. Will it take a bear on the south lawn of Queen's Park to force the ministry to do its job and manage wildlife? Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. As the member knows, uh, when the bear hunt was uh, cancelled in 1999 by the 
party opposite in the Conservative government. The, uh, our government took action by extending the fall hunt for bears and, in fact, uh, helped to increase the harvest numbers of bears in the province of Ontario. We know the uh, numbers are relatively uh, stable, uh, but we did help to increase the number of bears harvested across the province by increasing and expanding the fall hunt. But I certainly, uh, you know, I take the member's point. This is not uh, an issue that uh, we have been uh, neglecting. This is an issue we take very seriously, and we are developing a plan. And I look forward to uh, the member's support on the plan that we bring forward that will help to more aptly address Answer. the bear challenges. And I have to say, Speaker, that with the uh, communities in Northern Ontario as well that, he, that the member uh, is well aware of, that there are not Thank incidents you. occurring all out through. Uh, Thank you. New question, the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Research and Innovation. Wow. Our government recognizes, and I think all members would agree, that our capacity as a province to compete in the global knowledge-based economy depends in large part on how well the province is able to harness its research strength. Our track record is quite good. As a country, Canada ranks sixth in the world for the quality and the impact of its research. Ontario comprises nearly half of that expertise. Supporting research and innovation is fundamental to a competitive economy. Now, Ontario businesses, Speaker, invest $6 billion in research and development every year. That's almost half of Canada's total. So through you, Speaker, to the Minister of Research and Innovation, what is the provincial government doing further to support and advance research and development in our province? Thank you, Minister of Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I would like to thank the member from Oakville for that question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's research and development initiatives have always been in the forefront and the most uh, important priority for this government. Mr. Speaker, research and innovation creates good, valued jobs, and also it's the engine of the economy for tomorrow. Our government has committed $557 million to research projects through the Ontario Research Fund Research Excellence Program. This program and the recipients of this program, uh, Mr. Speaker, has leveraged $1.2 billion funding from uh, private and institutional uh, sources. We have also committed $760 million, Mr. Speaker, to Ontario Research Fund Research uh, Infrastructure Program. This program, Mr. Speaker, has leveraged $1.4 billion investment from other sources. And through this program, Mr. Speaker, we are Sir. funding 1,600 research projects across the province for their infrastructure and equipment costs. Mr. Speaker, I am proud that our government's investment in research and innovation has kept us Thank you. in the forefront. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I'm glad to hear that our government's continuing to invest in the research and development initiatives right here in the province. I think we'd all agree in this House that we know that that's going to help create jobs and that's going to spur the economic growth that we all want. It's going to allow us, if we do this, to continue to build an economic climate that offers the right condition that businesses are asking for to grow and create those jobs. Now, if we provide the necessary resources and support for researchers, we know that that's critical to the economic prosperity of this province in both the short term and the long run. We know we want to support world-class research, and we need to commercialize those technologies through from the research stage. But through you, Speaker, to the Minister of Research and Innovation, what other specific government programs are in place that will support and enhance research and development in this province? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member from Oakville for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of supporting necessary, uh, necessary means to researchers and the businesses to move their ideas and innovations from the labs to commercialization. One of the initiatives of our government is the Early Researcher Award Program to help uh, newly appointed researchers at our research institutions to build their team. The recipients of this initiative and this program, Mr. Speaker, they have, uh, they have trained 13,000 highly qualified researchers for the province of Ontario. Another initiative which we have been following, Mr. Speaker, is to, to assist the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research to create 1,600 high-quality jobs. Actually, yesterday I had the pleasure go, uh, with, the, uh, with the member from Whitby Oshawa visiting the Ontario Institute Answer. for Cancer Research. They are conducting world-class research, Mr. Speaker. We are so proud of the work they do. 
in order to cure cancer and to, and to manage this very dreadful disease, Mr. Speaker. So we are, I'm glad to report that we are in the forefront. Thank you. New question. The member from Holloman Norfolk. Speaker, to the Acting Premier, July 12th, under the authority of the Health Protection and Promotion Act, an illegal burger shack in Caledonia was ordered closed. Then on July 22nd, a cease and desist order was issued by the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. This burger shack is on MTO property, and the court order names your Minister of Infrastructure, but you have not closed this burger shack. Acting Premier, it's been two and a half months since the court order was issued. Why do you feel your government is above the law in disobeying this court injunction? Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Chair of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. As the, as the member opposite knows, those issues regarding the Burger Shack are before the court today as we speak in front of the Superior Court on both issues. And until the court uh, deals with that today and renders its decision, it would be inappropriate for anyone in this House to comment on that. Acting Premier, th this is to you a condemned burger shack next to an illegal smoke shack. It's on government land adjacent to Provincial Highway No. 6. No potable water, no sink to wash your hands, no refrigeration, intermittent power, clearly a threat to public health. Now, as we know, the Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit is trying to get a contempt of court ruling against your Minister of Infrastructure. I think you would agree it's unusual for a medical officer of health to have to get a contempt of court ruling against the Minister of the Crown. What will it take for your government to apply the rule of law? Acting Premier, we'll ask your minister, who is now and could be in contempt of court, Question. to step aside until this gets resolved. Stop the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister. Opposite knows full well that when issues of this importance are before the court, that it's inappropriate for anyone to comment on the case. Those issues. I didn't get things quiet for you to have another heckle. Finish, please. As we speak this very moment, those issues are being heard before the Superior Court of Ontario, a judge of that court, and you are being disrespectful by trying to raise those questions in the middle of a court hearing over in Brantford today. The member opposite knows better than that. Yes, sir. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Acting Premier, city leaders from Hamilton to Kingston are raising serious questions about the safety of Enbridge's proposal to reverse its Line 9 pipeline and pump tar sands crude right across Ontario. That's right. The Ontario government also has concerns. This summer, the Ministry of Energy asked Enbridge some important questions. Questions about the risks posed by Line 9 reversal to wetlands, shorelines, and the drinking water of millions of Ontarians. Unbelievably, Enbridge refused to answer those questions. How can the government ensure, ensure that Line 9 will be safe when it can't even get answers from Enbridge? Acting Premier. Minister of Rural Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We all have an interest in the transportation of energy resources and economic benefits that flow. In Ontario, we have a number of expectations around these kinds of projects. We expect that the highest safety and environmental standards will be met. The duty to consult with First Nations and all peoples must be met. Communities must be consulted in an open, transparent, and accessible fashion. The pipelines that cross provincial boundaries are federal decisions under the jurisdiction of the National Energy Board. 
Ontario has actively intervened in these hearings to ensure that the best interests of Ontarians are protected, including our safety, environment, jobs, and our economy. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, when matters affect the environment that Ontarians depend on, Ontario has the power and responsibility to act. Three years ago, three years ago, an Enbridge pipeline spilled millions of litres of heavy crude into the Kalamazoo River in Michigan, causing over a billion dollars worth of damage. The National Energy Board process concerning Line 9 doesn't examine all the environmental aspects, and the Ontario government can't even get basic safety questions answered by Enbridge. Mm. Quebec has set up its own public consultations. Why won't the Liberal government stand up for Ontarians' drinking water and their watersheds Question. and call your own full environmental assessment on the pipeline reversal? Minister. Mr. Speaker, pipelines that cross provincial boundaries are under the jurisdiction of the National Energy Board. The National Energy Board has a very rigorous process to ensure that safety and environmental standards are met. We expect the NAB to give careful consideration to all the facts and presentations prior to making any decisions. We have added to past hearings Ontario has participated to stress the importance of Aboriginal and public consultation. Our governments have a duty to ensure that the decisions made regarding large infrastructure projects, such as pipelines, include appropriate and meaningful public discussion. We continue to closely monitor the process and the health and safety and environmental impacts of this project. And I would suggest that Mr. Mulcair in Ottawa may want to ask some questions on behalf of Ontario. Answer. Thank you. Question, the member from Glengarry Prescott-Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the uh, very dedicated Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Speaker, we all agree that communities across this province need funding for capital projects uh, that enable and support social and economic development, and this includes our Aboriginal communities. Investing in Aboriginal communities is a priority for our government, and creating opportunity for everyone in Ontario is a benefit to all of us. One program that is a good example of our government's efforts to invest in Aboriginal communities is the Aboriginal Community Capital Grants Program. This program is bringing funding to communities across the province and is leading to more opportunities and more jobs in Aboriginal communities across the province. Speaker, calmly could the uh, minister tell us about the Capital Grants Program and the benefits it's providing to our Aboriginal people here in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you. Uh, this is an important question. Our government's Aboriginal Community Capital Grants Program helps First Nations and Aboriginal organizations build or renovate community centres or small business centres. And these centres support community development, new business opportunities, and can provide employment opportunities and tools that improve job skills and wellness for Aboriginal peoples. In 2013-14, my ministry will invest approximately $3 million in infrastructure projects through this grant program. Since October 2003, the Aboriginal Community Grants Program has provided more than $30.7 million to Aboriginal communities through 112 major and minor capital grants programs and feasibility studies. We continue to support community capital grant development for First Nations and Aboriginal. Yes, sir. These are just an example of the range of programs that are available through this uh, capital grants program. It's a way in which the province is demonstrating that it Thank wants you. to work with Aboriginal communities to provide Thank jobs. The Minister of Finance on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was wondering, hoping that members of this House could join me in welcoming Yama Thompson, Sierra Leone Country Director of Journalists for Human Rights and Canada's largest medical development organization, who is joined by Catherine Shepherd here in the House today. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion for allocation of time on Government Order No. 8. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
The members take their seats, please. All members, take your seats, please. All members. On October the 2nd, Mr. Malloy moved government notice of motion number 23. All those in favour rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Malloy. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mrs. Jeffries. Mrs. Jeffries. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Ms. Prudza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackvi. Mr. Nackvi. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Zellia. Mr. Zellia. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Holiday. Mr. Holiday. Ms. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. All those opposed will rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. We should be solved. Should be solved. Ms. Harvath. Ms. Harvath. Ms. Genovo. Ms. Genovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadisha. Mr. Nadisha. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. The ayes being 74 and the nays being 20, I declare the motion carried. There are point of order for the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker. I just want to uh, welcome the uh, St. Mary Catholic Elementary School from the fine village of Grafton from my great riding, Northumberland, Quinty West, here at Queen's Park. Today. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.